sound design. If they work in a venue where there's a lot of artists that are touring that come through, that is the best place to to build connections. Just meet the crew, meet the the production managers, the tour managers, the stage managers, the other crew members, and build connections with them because they are the people who are going to refer you for a job. Sound design. Sound Design Live is produced independently by me, Nathan Lively, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome to Sound Design Live, the home of the world's best online training and sound system tuning that you can do at your own pace from anywhere in the world. I'm Nathan Lively, and today I'm joined by touring front of house sound engineer. Mich- <laughs> I got nervous. Oh, I got nervous right before I did it. That's funny. I'm Nathan Lively, and today I'm joined by touring front of house sound engineer Michelle Sabalchik Petinado. Michelle, welcome to Sound Design Live. Hi. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited to have you. Um, you have worked with the Spin Doctors, Indigo Girls, Sticks, Melissa Etheridge, Gwen Stefani, Keisha, Kesha, Kesha. shit, <laughs> Kesha, Jewel, Mr. Big, Goo Goo Dolls, Christina Aguilera, and Adam Lambert. So, what is one song that you would be happy to never hear again? Oh God, oh, I don't know if I can say that without hurting anyone's feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because all of those people listen to the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I would say probably TikTok by Kesha. <laughs> All right, Michelle. So back in September, you and I and 10 other authors published a book called Get On Tour. And what I'd love to do today is kind of take a deeper dive into some of the things that you wrote about. Your chapter in that book is by far one of my favorite. It's just full of so many quotable moments where you just flat out say things that I feel like, unless you've spent some years in the industry doing this job, you wouldn't know. Super valuable. So um, I want to go back to this moment right before you got your very first tour. Because I think um, not only is an interesting time, I think, in your life, but also it's very interesting. This is the moment a lot of people are curious about, like, when is this going to happen? What's this going to look like for me in my life, in my career? So I'm going to read this sentence that you wrote. For several years before I started touring, I worked at a local sound company in the AV department at an entertainment complex, as a stagehand, at a nightclub, mixing local bands, and occasionally as an assistant at a recording studio. So uh, how did this happen? I don't know a whole lot of other people who maybe intentionally or just end up doing working across so many different jobs in different places. So I'm curious, was this intentional? Did someone tell you that it would be a good idea for you to work in a lot of different places? Or did this just happen kind of as out of necessity as you were looking for more work opportunities? Um, it, no, it was definitely intentional. Um, it, it was just out of the fact that my goal was to work in live sound. I mean, originally, I wanted to be a recording engineer. So I, I went to college for a year uh, majoring in music and realized I wasn't going to learn anything that I needed to learn to be a recording engineer. So after that, I went to the recording workshop in Chillicothe, Ohio, and they had a very basic intro to recording engineering program that was about a month long. From there, I got a job. Um, there was a, a new radio station opening where I lived, and I went and said, you know, I'd like to apply for a job to make commercials. And they said, okay, great, but you gotta have, you're going to have to sell them first. So I basically was, you know, selling radio advertising, and whenever I'd sell commercials, I could make them and play in the studio, but it was still oh, wow. really wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, and I did that for several months, and then I had a cousin who lived in Nashville, and she invited me to come down and, and stay with her and see if I could get a job at a studio in Nashville. So I did that for three weeks. I walked around Music Row in Nashville, handing out my resume to every studio I could find and and realizing that I still really had no idea what I was doing or how to get my foot (laughs) in the door. So I went back home. And um, at that point, I heard about Full Sail in Florida. So I enrolled in Full Sail. And while I was in Full Sail, I, I 
changed my course into live sound because I originally wanted to work in the studio and I never mm-hmm. even considered live sound as an option. Yeah, me but while either. I was, yeah. And while I was there, I, when I took my live sound class, I thought, well, this is it. This is perfect for me because I love to travel and I love the whole, you know, live music and, and the feel and the vibe from that. So when I finished my, uh, when I finished full cell, you had to do an internship before you actually got your diploma. And I did my internship. It was 240 hours and I did it in something like two weeks because I just worked my butt off. I was working at a little local sound company and I was working wow. in the shop during the day and then doing shows at night, Thursday through Sunday. So I finished my internship in no time. And I worked there for a few more months, but it was, oh, sorry about that. I just got an email. Let me uh, quit that so that it doesn't interrupt Why us no? Again. Let's answer it live on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, worked for the sound company for as long as I could afford because they weren't paying me. It was, you know, just kind of like a unpaid internship. And at that point I was trying to find more work and I I moved back to Florida and, you know, my goal was to to just stay working towards my career path. I didn't want to just take any job. I just figured I would do whatever job I could find that was in, you know, live sound or live music or somehow related. So I would just learn and get as much experience as I could. And that's where I, I ended up. I worked at Church Street Station, which was this big entertainment complex in downtown Orlando. Um, I mixed in a couple of the nightclubs there. They also would have street parties. And then most of the time you were just kind of, you know, fixing cables and, and playing AV tech to all the different rooms that had, you know, any kind of AV equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked at a nightclub in Kissimmee called Little Darlings, where I was... Uh, I did sound when the A and B engineers weren't available and I did lights the rest of the time. Um, I worked as a stage hand. I worked for another sound company down there. I just, whatever I could to, to keep gaining experience and stay in the business because I felt like, well, if I want to be in live sound, I'm not going to take a job at a grocery store, you know, cause it's not going to help. So, yeah. And I don't know if you knew this at the time, but I think that this probably really benefited you because if everyone in the world knew what I was really good at, then I would never have to look for work again. Because if everyone knew, then then anytime that kind of work came up, then people would call me. So you talk about how everyone should know that you want to be on tour or everyone should right. know kind of what job you want. So I don't think you really knew at the time, but you were sort of like having interactions with so many people in so many places that you were kind of increasing your uh, maybe luck surface area, maybe we can say. Right. Yeah. And, but it doesn't sound like you, you didn't know that when you were sort of like getting out of school and getting your first jobs, you sort of just, you got one job and then you had a little bit more time and you thought, Oh, I should get another job and another job and another job. Yeah. And, and also, And also continuing to try to find the things that really, I guess, gave you satisfaction or felt like this is right. This is a good fit. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, definitely the whole thing about telling people what I wanted to do. That wasn't by design. That was just kind of, you know, look, this is my dream. This is my goal. And and when people that I went to school with, you know, when everybody would talk about what is your, you know, your goal when you get out of here. Um, everybody that I knew at the school, including my, my instructors knew I wanted desperately to get into live sound and get on tour. And, um, (laughs) even one of my instructors, he had a friend who owned a sound company and arranged for an interview with, for me, um, while I was in school. And, um, the spin doctor tour, you know, actually came from a classmate who I met while I was at school and he, uh, you know, immediately went to work for audio analyst after he graduated and was on tour, you know, on a lot of big tours as a, as a PA tech for several years after school. And then, um, finished, I think he was on Billy Joel's Stormfront tour, which was, you know, well over a year long. And he just finished that and the spin doctors were starting to kind of get some attention. And I guess he was friends with someone in their management company or their agent. And they asked him if he would come out and mix them because they were starting to get some attention and, and he, you know, they needed somebody good. So he took the job, but shortly thereafter realized, oh my God, like I'm just burned out. I need a break. I want to go home. So oh, he wow. 
thought about me and he called me up and offered me the job. And it was about a month before their album just hit, you know, the Billboard Top 100. And, mm -hmm. and you know, but it was essentially that came from a classmate who was friends with, you know, I was friends with and, and just remembered me always saying that this is what I want to do. And he gave me a shot, you know. And so... At this point, I guess whenever people ask you if they should go to school to study audio, if they want to do the job that you're doing, you always say, yes, of course, because that's where you'll meet the person who's going to hire you for your first tour. <laughs> well, no, not necessarily. Because, um, you know, there's there's so many paths into this business. And for me, I grew up in a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere with no music you know, no music business or anything that I had no idea. I had no idea how to even get started. So the only thing I could figure was, well, I'll go to school and learn how to do this. And then that will be the first step. Um, but, you know, people who live in, in cities where there's a good live music scene or, you know, they have opportunities around them to learn. You know, if you have a, a there's a sound company or a nightclub or somewhere that you can actually get hands on experience and someone who will take you under their wing, that's a, a great opportunity as well. So it's, it's just different for everybody. Well, I want to take a couple steps backward and talk more, a little bit more about your friend that hired you for this first tour. So I think a real milestone in your story here is this event um, right before this happened. And as you mentioned, you you credit this to simple word of mouth marketing. Your friend knew that you wanted to, this job, knew that you wanted to be on tour, so they thought right. of you. Right. You say, um, I made sure everyone knew that I wanted to be on tour. I talked constantly with friends and colleagues about touring. And when I worked with visiting bands and engineers, I would pick their brain about how they got started. When the opportunity came, I seized it. So I wondered if you could just um, take us back to that time when you had those jobs before you, and so you were doing lots of different jobs at the time and before you got the call for that tour. So, and if you could just talk a little bit about what was going on in a bit more detail, um, kind of on the ground in practice how did you make sure that everyone knew you wanted to be on tour? Like if I was the visiting engineer, what kind of things were you saying to me? Were you just saying, hi, Michelle, I want to be on tour. Call me all the time. I don't know. Uh, no, it was, uh, God, it, so fun. it was so long ago. Um, and it was more <laughs> just like, you know, you know, I'd be working with them. Uh, it, the, the places I worked, we didn't have a lot of visiting engineers, but every once in a while when we'd do a, a festival or a street party kind of thing, um, and I'd meet somebody new, because uh, it wasn't really, I wasn't meeting a lot of touring engineers. Um, it was just people who had more experience than me. Mm. And uh, it was just more of, well, you know, how did you learn this? And what, you know, what would you do if this is, you know, this is what I want to do. Do you have any advice? Like, can you give me any direction? Uh, okay. And, no, that's yeah. great. That's actually really helpful. This is what I want to do. Do you have any advice? Not like do something for me, but what would you right. do if you were in my shoes? Right, exactly. Because I was just, you know, it was a matter of like, how do I get my foot in the door? You know, and I was I was sending out resumes to, um, back at, at that time, Polestar Magazine used to have these directories mm -hmm. um, for, you know, all aspects of the business. Like they'd have one for agents, one for management companies, one for trucking, one for sound companies, one for lighting companies, you know, just everything. And I had the, uh, the sound company directory, which I would just send, you know, probably 25 resumes a week to to every sound company I could find. You know, oh, just, wow. And, and constantly sending out resumes and calling and trying to get a job. And, and you know, some of the ones that I really wanted to work for, I'd call them back and be like, well, you know, can you give me any, what are you looking for? You know, if you're not hiring now, what are you looking for? And, you mm -hmm. know, how can I get my foot in the door? But it, it's just, you know, you just kind of got to keep plugging away until finally someone opens that door for you. Did you get any responses from those mini resumes you were sending out? Do you feel like that was uh, worth the effort? Um, <laughs> that's a good question because no, I didn't get any job offers from any of them. Um, uh, it was just a lot of like, no, we don't need anybody right now. And I'd call them back in a couple of weeks. No, we still don't need anybody. And, you know, but I didn't know what else to do. So I just tried every, every avenue I could think of. Sure. Yeah. I'm just thinking that if that's one, if that's something that you were doing a lot of, maybe that's something that a lot of other people were doing a lot of. And so it's right. sort of hard to cut through the noise, but I do appreciate that you were then calling and getting some information. So maybe you didn't ever get a job with any of those people that you were reaching out to, but maybe you did some good research and got some good information. Maybe right. some of them told you, Hey, here's what we're looking for. Or 
now here's why now is not a good time. Do you, do you remember any of those conversations? Yeah, um, I remember, um, actually, it's pretty ironic because uh, Claire Brothers, because they were kind of in my backyard, um, calling them and just constantly being told, we don't need anybody for touring. We need people that want to sit in the shop and fix equipment. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to go on the road, but we need people who just want to sit in the shop all day and fix gear. And I said, well, I'm fine with doing that if I know that there's eventually going to be an opportunity. But, you know, it was just kind of like, no, no, no. And ironically, as soon as I started working for the Spin Doctors, uh, within two years, I was a client of theirs. I was a client okay. of Claire Brothers because we were carrying, you know, Claire Brothers for our sound system. Sure. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, I mean, you know, and I do know people who have gotten jobs because they were persistent, who they knew they wanted to work for this company, whoever it was, and they, you know, would send the resumes, make the phone calls, make the connections, go, you know, and and try and meet the hire whoever's hiring, meet them for coffee or you know, just make a personal connection where I was at the time living in Florida and just sending them resumes to everywhere in the country. So it wasn't really, you know, possible for me to fly out. I was, you know, I was broke. I couldn't just like drive out and fly out and meet these people. So, Mm -hmm. but you know, I knew, I do know people who do get, you know, jobs that way because they, they just are persistent and like, look, I'm serious about this. I really want to do this. And what, what's it going to take for me to get a job here? And, and, you know, eventually the people who are hiring need somebody and that's the first person that they think of. Do you think it would save people time or maybe be more worth their time or effort to focus on building relationships with colleagues and artists, specifically if they want to be work as a touring front of house engineer, uh, instead of putting a lot of time and effort into reaching out to say companies? Yeah, um, definitely. If, if, if you're like, if they work in a venue where there's a lot of artists that are touring that come through, um, that is the best place to, to build connections. Just meet the crew, meet the, the production managers, the tour managers, the stage managers, the other crew members and build connections with them because they are the people who are going to refer you for a job especially if you worked with them that day and they liked what you did and, and they liked your personality, you know, if you build a connection with them and stay in touch, they're way more likely to recommend you um, rather than if, you know, they just met you and they don't really know how you work. They didn't really get to spend any time with you. Um, you know, if you're just kind of a faceless name, like you're sending a resume out to a sound company and they have no idea who you are, um, it's going to be a lot harder to, to forge a connection through that. So, artists, if there's like a particular artist that you work with a lot and they like you, you know, just stay on top of it, stay in touch with them, find out, you know, who their management is or if they have a tour manager or production manager and, and make that connection. Cause those are the people who essentially do most of the hiring for the positions. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about how the hiring process works. Cause I think that will really empower me to then, uh, just, Just understand and and make sure that I'm doing everything I can to get more of the work that I really want. So, uh, so could you kind of walk me through it from the initial idea where a production company or an artist says, I want to have a tour. What are sort of then the chain of events and people that lead to you or someone else getting hired for a tour? Okay. So yeah, if if an artist decides they're going to go on tour, um, the first thing that usually happens is their management will hire a tour manager and a production manager if they are at that level where they need both. It's usually someone that the management company knows, has a relationship with, and from there, they'll build the crew. Now, if the artist has a sound engineer that they, they like and they're familiar with, they can always say, hey, we want you know Bob to, to be our sound man. Um, if they don't, it generally falls on the tour manager and or production manager to to fill that position. And they will, the first thing that they will do is call all the people that they know that they like working with. And then if none of those people are available, they'll reach out to, to their contacts and say, okay, well, who can you recommend? But it's almost always, you know, someone that knows somebody because it's such a high responsibility. You know, you're kind of an extension of the band and you've got a lot of responsibility on your back. So it's, it's hard to put someone that no one knows and has, you know, no experience with in that role. So it usually comes from whether it's someone that management has has used before or someone that the tour manager or production manager or band has used before. Right. So I need to have a professional relationship with either the artist or a tour manager if I'm going to get that job directly from them. 
Right. Now, if it's a band that's just starting out, you know, and they're on their way up, they're, you know, more likely to, you know, hire somebody who is kind of new as well, you know, because then you can grow together. It's not, you know, if the band's just playing like their first U.S. tour in a van and clubs, you know, that there's not as much pressure as, you know, someone who's going out and doing arenas, you know, and selling, you know, 80,000 tickets a night. So... Mm -hmm. Michelle, let's talk about the Mr. Big Tour. Um, is that, that's what you've been working on most recently, right? Yeah, I've been with them since last May, and we actually just finished up in um, late August, and then I've been back with Sticks again for a couple weeks after that. Okay. Um, well, I think that's that would be fun to talk about, since that's what you've been doing most recently, and, and it sounds like... Um, you know, there's a lot going on on the stage. So could you kind of give me an overview of the inputs that you're mixing? Yeah, for Mr. Big, it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, they're just a, a four-piece rock band, uh, drums, uh, bass, electric guitar, a couple acoustic guitars, and four vocals. The Probably the most peculiar thing is the bass rig. It's not your, your typical bass rig. Um, Billy Sheehan has his own unique bass tone. And what he's got is he has two outputs on his bass guitar. One that he calls his high output, which is basically a full range output, and then one just for the, the lows and the sub lows. So he controls how much of both he's sending to me at any given time. So he can blend that to suit what he's looking for. Oh, cool. And I take the high output um, and I roll it off below 100. And mainly I use a DI, basically a direct out of the the uh, bass head and also a mic on the cabinet. And I the DI output is, is strictly like an emergency backup. Like if I lose the mic, then I'll use the DI, but mainly I use the mic on the cabinet because that's got all of his processing and he's got a lot of, um, a lot of stuff going on, like heavy compression, some uh, distortion, different effects. It's, it's constantly evolving, but the, the mic on the cabinet is basically picking up what his his tone you know what he's doing and then i also take the direct out of the low output and use that and blend them together everything below 100 hertz is just from a di and everything above 100 hertz is um from the mic on the cabinet yeah well for the low i actually i leave it full range i don't roll off anything okay. on that but it's mainly that's where i get most of the the good sub lows from is there any timing or phase differences from these two inputs coming in have you ever been able to, yeah, to it's, look at that? It's occasionally, I, I always have to check the phase every day because, um, and, and it's for whatever reason, some days we'll have a phase issue where I'll have to flip the, the uh, mic out of phase and some days I won't. Um, the other thing is he, we, we travel all over the world and the guys are all endorsed. So we get, like if we're not on tour in the US or Japan or Europe, it, like when we're in Southeast Asia or you know, wherever, like doing fly dates, the, the gear is different everywhere we go. So he uses Hartke and we have uh, five 15 inch speaker cabinets and three bass heads. It's, it's a huge bass rig for, <laughs> you know, for anybody, but it's not um, what it is, is there's two cabinets for the highs, two for the lows. And one of each of those is a spare. And then there's also a cabinet for um, a bass pedal. He's got a bass pedals. So, um, but there's also three bass heads plus a spare backup head. Wow. So it's, it's, it's quite a huge bass rig for, yeah. for what it is. Um, so that, you know, and, and the quality can vary from place to place. So, you know, sometimes they, they don't sound as good as they do in other places. So there's always little issues that you have to deal with every day. Yeah. That sounds like a little, that, that probably makes it challenging for you if it's not the exact same equipment set up the exact right. same way every time. Right. But I don't know, maybe that's also interesting for you. Is that a good challenge or an annoying It's more challenge? of a challenge for his bass tech okay. because every Got day it. it's kind of him trying to cobble it together and make it work. <laughs> So, um, what is the microphone you're using for the bass amp? Um, I use a Bayer M88. Cool. And have, have, did you try others or did you just know that one would work and then it worked? Yeah, um, no, I, I used, um, for a while I was using an RE20, sometimes a Sennheiser 421. Uh, we've even used just a 57, but my, my mic of choice is the Bayer M88 because it's a little bit punchy. Is everyone else using amps live on stage? What's the yeah. sound level like? 
Uh, it's on it's on a ridiculously loud. Oh uh, yeah, God. we have our guitar player. He plays through um, a Marshall, two Marshall four by twelve. Yes. The, the thing is, they're all deaf. Oh <laughs> I mean, these guys God. are in their sixties, and they've been playing, you know, loud rock and roll for forty some years. So they're they're all deaf. So it's the stage volume is is pretty loud. Wow. How, so <laughs> how do you? That's got to be a big problem with you. I mean, you've got drums and amps, and I don't know what else going in all your vocal mics. What are you doing for that? Yeah, well, I, the big thing is the the vocal mic, you know, choosing because they, they're also they're you know very heavy, heavily um, based on four part harmonies. So all the guys sing, and it's you know the harmonies. That's the vocals are are for even though they're a hard rock band, the vocals are an important part of their sound. So it's you know it's important to get those out on top. So I use on um, on the band I use EV ND seventy six microphone. And on the singer, I on the lead singer, I use a Telefunken M80, M80 on a Shure wireless stick, um, and they I find that they sound very similar. The, the only reason we don't use the EV on the lead singer is because they don't have a, a wireless capsule. So um, Telefunken makes a great, you know, the M80 is a great sounding microphone, and that both mics are really good at getting a lot of um, good solid present sounding vocals with uh, a lot of gain before feedback. And is that due to the polar pattern or handling noise? Is there something about the mic that you could point to that makes that work? Yeah, well? there. The pattern is is uh, I think it's not hypercardioid, but it's it's definitely a tighter pattern. Uh, super cardioid for the okay. for the ND seventy six. I'm just looking at it right now. It's also the the frequency response. It's just the, the I find that the low end, the, the low mids, are, is a lot more clear than most vocal mics. I don't have to quite take out so much mm -hmm. to get the clarity and the depth. Um, and it's got a nice solid mid range as well. Anything else interesting or unique going on on stage that you'd like to share? It's just, uh, well, you've got, you know, your guitar player and bass player who are, are kind of virtuosos, you know, they're the top of their craft and, um, so there's a, they're, you know, kind of from the era of shredders. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, <laughs> musical information going on between the two of them at all times. And I still have to fit drums and vocals in between there. So I do a lot of uh, carving out space for everything in the mix with EQing and a lot of hands on faders mixing, just bringing specific things in and out at the appropriate time. So you're not just trying to make sense of, you know, too much information all at once. You know, like if the guitar player forgets that he's not the only guy on stage and he's, you know, playing a million notes over the verse, it's like, okay, well, the, the, the vocals are a little bit more important right now. So I'm going to bring him down. And then mm -hmm. when he has his little fill, I'll push him back up and, and the same with the bass player and, and, you know, just kind of fitting it all in and, and carving space. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of competition for the mid-range. Do you find yourself also kind of actively EQing things? So like now the vocal needs to be present, so we need to cut the mid-range out of the guitars, or is it mostly just level? I do um, EQ, like, well, the other thing is too, the bass player, his tone is is very heavily mid-range. Mm. <laughs> so it is a wow. lot of mid-range. And um, I do... They, they actually, they have over the years, since they've been together for so long, have kind of worked their sound to everything just kind of fits, you know, like okay. the, uh, the singer's vocal is, is got such depth that he, um, just kind of fits in between all that, you know, and, and the hardest part is just getting the backing vocals out on top, you know, cause they tend to be a little bit softer. And so it's trying to get that stuff to cut through. Um, cause the guitar player, his tone has, has, you know, changed through the years, but they just kind of all seem to fit well with each other. But I do a little bit of carving out on the EQ just to allow holes for things. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, it's just kind of been, I think they've kind of honed it over the years themselves. All right. So it's not, uh, an incredible challenge for you. I'm sure it would have been harder if this was maybe 20 years ago. And they yeah. were just starting I mean, or something. One of the most, uh, recently the most challenging things was their original drummer who sadly passed away earlier this year. Oh, wow. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2014. And he was an incredible drummer. He was just probably the most talented drummer I've ever worked with. And I've worked with a lot of amazing drummers. But he is talking about, you know, honing their sound and having a place for everything. Like he had his drum kit just, it fits so perfectly in between the bass and the guitars. And, and the 
he had an incredible groove where, you know, you've got these two guitar players just playing a million notes a second. <laughs> and if you throw a drummer in there who's trying to throw in a tom fill everywhere there's a space, you know, it's just going to be too much. Sure. And he didn't Chaos. ever do that. He just knew how to lay back and just how to really drive what can just be a lot of shredding, but to actually turn that into a groove and make it musical and just, you know, leave space and, and not try to remind everybody like, Hey, I'm the drummer back here, you know, by throwing <laughs> sure. in a lot of unnecessary stuff, but he was incredibly creative on what he did do. So in 2014, when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, um, we had a, a substitute drummer come out and fill in for him. And so what happened was we had both Pat, the original drummer and the substitute, um, and Pat played at a cocktail kit because he was a crucial part of the harmonies as well. He did a very, um, his, his tone, his vocal tone was very, uh, a, a huge part of their sound. Okay. So Pat would, would sing and play at a cocktail kit. And a then, cocktail kit um, is just smaller? Yeah. It's just like a, he'd stand there and be like a, a, a kind of like a little snare. Oh, so you can stand drum. at it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then he would play on the, on the regular kit. He'd play like about four or five songs a night, you know? Um, but the, the new drummer, the guy who, who came in to fill in for him had a very different tone and it was a struggle for, you know, a couple years because his, his drum kit, just his tone and his sounds did not fit mm. the band. Like we're here, these guys had, it was, it was dialed in, you know, everything, you know, I basically just had to turn it on and it kind of mixed itself cause mm. it was so dialed in wow. and his, his sounds did not fit. So it was kind of like taking what, uh, you know, when I started working for them in 2009 was one of the easiest bands I've ever mixed. And it turned it into one of the hardest bands I've ever had to mix. Wow, Cause so then I was do? really doing, yeah, doing a lot of carving and, and trying to totally blend things, you know, that, that just weren't working anymore. Uh, so right. that was a bit a of a struggle. Work. Yeah. Okay. So how have things sort of balanced out since then? Or, or, you know, you just, it's just more work. Well, it, yeah, it, it did kind of balance because uh, Pat worked with with the, the the guy who was filling in like over the last year. Like he, he, you know, they really worked on getting his kit to sound more like Pat's kit and and to get it to fit more musically. So that helped a lot. And how are your ears doing? I'm just realizing if that's a super incredibly loud stage, then I'm sure the shows <laughs> are incredibly loud. Yeah, it's surprisingly okay. I the last um, I had them checked a couple of years ago because I w had done right after I finished. Um, it was like a year with Mr. Big, and I went out and did uh, this uh, boy band called Big Time Rush, which Ooh. was it was a uh, sheds and it was you know twenty thousand screaming little girls every <laughs> night, <laughs> and you know it was just like that that two point five k in your head all night. So I would just end up mixing with earplugs in because at that point. Um, none of those little girls care what the snare drum sounds like. So it's, you know, it's like you have to, I don't like to mix with earplugs because you always tend to, even though I have the special ones that just filter, you know, by ac across the entire frequency range, but it's still, you tend to overcompensate and I'm always popping them out. But on, on that tour, I just started, it was like, you know, I know everything sounds okay. So I'm going to put my earplugs in and the girls can't really hear anything when they're screaming their heads off anyway. So, you know, unless I'll, unless I start seeing any weird looks, it's, you know, I'm just going to mix with earplugs in and save my hearing. And I had my hearing checked after that tour and I was surprised it hadn't changed in 20 years, which I was shocked because I was wow, pretty sure. Wow, amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you were nervous. Yeah. Wait a minute before you tell me anything, how was your um, Michelle, tell me about what's in your work bag. I don't know if you have a million things, but maybe you could um, share a few highlights of uh, what you take with you on the road for technical um, stuff. Sure. I have uh, my headphones, um, flashlight, Sharpies, um, a tuning CD with all the songs I use for tuning. I have a little karaoke mic with a switch on it that I use for a talkback mic in case the uh, there's no switchable talkback mic available. Okay. Um, and that's just a regular adapters. handheld? Yeah, it's just a tiny little... Actually, it was a, I, it was a gift from... Um, Mr. Big's original monitor engineer, who's Japanese, because uh, we when we were flying around the world doing all these one-offs and they'd never have a switchable talkback mic, he finally bought me this little tiny karaoke mic. It's like <laughs> something a little kid would use. <laughs> but it's great because you can stick it in your pocket, you know, and, sure. and you're not going to lose it. I also have my uh, yeah, iPod to XLR cable because I use I have an old iPhone that I use for walk-in music and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
my cool towel, which is very important for outdoor summer gigs when it's 100 degrees. It's one of those little towels that you uh, you wet it and you snap it and you just put it on your shoulders and it drops your body temperature like 10 degrees. It's awesome. Wow, it's, I don't know about that. It's a survival this. So tool. If I just look up cool towel, summer. I'll find it? Yep. Okay, yeah, cool. I think you can get them from Amazon. Eh, like batteries, some adapters, earplugs, uh, my Gerber multi-tool, e-tape, Purell, that kind of stuff. What headphones are you using? Uh, the Sony MD7506s. And what earplugs are you using? I have custom Sensophonics that I had made. Is there one book that you feel like has been immensely helpful to you? Um, yeah, I would say Richard Bach's Illusions. Mm-hmm. Um, Richard Bach wrote Jonathan Livingston Siegel, which I think everybody had to read in grade school or high school. Um, but it's just a, it's a short story. It's a great story. And I read it in high school and it really resonated with me. It basically tells you how you create your own reality and your life and the world that you live in is really just created from your beliefs. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of something that it totally made sense to me. And I've kind of tried to live by that. Michelle, do you listen to any podcasts? Um, I do. I have a couple. I'm I'm really, please say sound design live. Oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> sound Design Live. <laughs> Couple that I'm very, very far behind in, but um, Sound Design Live. Yeah, what, what um, podcast do you listen to regularly? Or, well, the, you said the, you're behind, so what do you like to listen to? Yeah, um, The Tim Ferriss Show Okay. and The Living Experiment. Those are my two kind of regulars. Okay, you listen to The Tim Ferriss Show. Um, I know you try to work out as much as possible when you're on the road um, to sort of like keep your sanity and, you know, stay feeling good. Um, Is that one of the reasons you're kind of into fitness and and health and working out? Yeah. I mean, I I just try, like, I know I feel better. Um, I try and do, I I get bored really easy because I hate working out. Like I I love walking so I could walk for hours, you know, but um, like the thought of having to like take the time to go do a workout was was never appealing to me. Mm -hmm. But um, several years back, I discovered kettlebell. And I love the kettlebell because it's the only workout that I ever really feel like, wow, I actually just did something, you know, like it could do aerobics for hours and just sweat my butt off, but not really feel like I did anything. Sure. (laughs) So, so I had, um, there was several years where I was actually taking a kettlebell on tour with me and just doing my workouts in my hotel room on days off or wherever I could. And, um, that and yoga, like yoga I find is really helpful. It, when I do it regularly, I, I have a lot less aches and pains. And when I stop doing it, everything starts to just tense up and, and get sore. So I try to really be faithful with doing yoga. Would you be impressed if I told you that I have a 50 pound kettlebell in my house? I would be. It's That's pretty gigantic. Awesome. Yeah, I, my, mine is a 25, so the 50, that's got to be huge. Yeah, I don't do it, but uh, my wife does. <laughs> She's way stronger than me. Um, uh-huh. So tell me about where you kind of get your coaching or training from. Are you um, doing some videos online? How are you doing the stuff on the road where you are doing yoga and you're doing kettlebell swings? Did someone like create a program for you and you just do the same stuff all the time? Uh, no, I'm... a big uh like online youtube uh like i i have a couple there's a my yoga works that i i get some great yoga videos from um sadie nardini is also another yogi that i follow um and then the kettlebell uh yeah i've got a couple videos on like on youtube that i i use yeah i'm always like looking on youtube to find new new routines and things like that okay so it's just kind of like whatever you can find at the time there's not um maybe a series of kettlebell trainings that you're following regularly right okay. yeah because I, like i said i get bored really easily so sure. like, i'll find something and i'll do it for a while and then it's like all right i know i need something new yeah i totally get that i was into i was super into pilates for about a year or a year and a half mm-hmm. and i got there's a site that i'm not sure if it's still around called pilates anytime something like that but it was great because it kind of really solved that problem of getting bored and needing some kind of novelty in the workout because there were always new videos. So I could log on every time and do something different every time. The EQL directory powered by sound girls. The one question is why aren't there more women working in sound and audio production? And hearing the lame excuse from people that, oh, you know, we'd love to hire more women, but we just can't find them. Sure. And, and we know they're out there. So um, the directory is basically a, you know, directory of women in all fields of audio production and touring. There's, I think there's some lighting, backline technicians, 
But just basically a place for that. If someone says, oh, I'd love to hire women, but I don't know where to find them, here you go. You can look them up on here and, and um, everyone can you know create a profile, put their resume, their contact info, and you can sort by field. Um, you know, If you're looking for a front of house engineer, if you're looking for a mastering engineer, um, it's, it's easily you know searchable. And Spotify actually has gotten involved and is, is supporting it, which is great. All right, Michelle, thank you so much for joining me on Sound Design Live. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Sound Design. Yeah. I want to thank Nicholas Haru for the music in today's episode. If you want to find more of his music, you can do that over at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas dash Haru. That's N-I-K-L-A-S dash H-A-R-J-U. Sound Design Live is supported by Chris, Dave, DC Sound Op, Ellis, Senqui, Joel, Kuba, Learn Stage Lighting, Martin, Michael, Nicholas, and Rody Free Radio. You can start supporting Sound Design Live today for as little as $1 over at patreon.com slash sounddesignlive. 